really good to be here. Um, and you know, I just want to honor the folks who help put this on every year. It seems effortless, and that's a testament to how well they've evolved this model. A lot of times what we do as activists is in fact creating a container. And then we're letting others fill it, and sometimes organically and dynamically so, um, having to deal with all the variables that come with that. So I just want to take a moment to honor the folks. You can see them with the local, lo local to Global Justice shirts on. But let's just have a round of applause for the people that are here. So I want to talk a little bit about a concept that I think of as a radical concept. But, of course, as my friend and mentor, Pat Lauderdale, once taught me, sometimes the word radical is unnecessary. It's kind of embedded in the notion. Empathy, as a working concept, if we actually put it into practice in our lives, would be among the most radical things we could do in this world. And we may not often think of it that way, because empathy sounds, you know, kind of naive, or it's very sweet, or it's nice to be empathetic, but it doesn't necessarily connote radicalism. But in fact, I'd like to suggest to you that if we did take it and operationalize it in our lives and our work, it might be just the key not only to helping to change the world, but also toward meeting the goals for what we're here to do this weekend, which is to promote a dialogue toward healing and renewal. We need some of that. Sometimes we tend to skip that step, especially as people who care about the larger issues in the world, we sometimes deny ourselves care and healing in the process. Think of the irony. We're out to save the world, but we don't work on saving ourselves. That seems a little backwards sometimes, but that's part of the, the choice that we make. So the double meaning of radical empathy is that A, the concept is radical, but I would also like to suggest that we think a little bit about having empathy for the radical. If we can have sympathy for the devil, we can certainly have empathy for the radical. I think it's only fair, maybe there's a song in there somewhere, if anybody feels ambitious, empathy for the radical. So here's a starting point just to get us into thinking about the topic. First of all, radical empathy potentially includes some of the most cutting edge theories of the human capacity for compassion. This isn't just speculation or wishful thinking. Science is actually beginning to catch up and prove that there are actually empirical and rational bases for understanding empathy as a big part of the human equation. It's always interesting that science seems to lag behind common sense by a few centuries. Things that we've accepted as fundamental truths, I mean we in the big picture of humankind, for eons, eventually science comes around and proves them. All of the indigenous cosmologies turned out to be right, according to the quantum theorists. They finally figured it out like thousands of years later. Well, empathy is in that same category, that it's the cutting edge of science, and yet it's something that's been with us since the beginning. It also includes something along the lines of thinking about ethics in a different way. Ethics as a function of relationships, rather than a static endpoint that we aim for, or some objective criteria from which to measure our actions and activities. Ethics is something to be constantly negotiated in our relationships with each other, often and ourselves, oftentimes around the concept of care, and how we express caring and compassionate and loving intentions toward ourselves, our communities, and the world itself. At the end of the day, those things aren't all that separate, after all. The capacity to manifest compassion or love toward anything is emblematic of our capacity to do so toward the whole, as well. And then there's another piece in here. I've got the kind of bullet points highlighted in red for you. The notion that we oftentimes in this culture tend to individualize and privatize our struggles and challenges. So for many of us, you know, especially those of us who are actively engaged with the struggles and challenges in our midst, we tend to think of our own pursuits as being the ones that we have to bear more silently. We're more reluctant to share our own stories than we are to work on behalf of somebody else. It's easier to locate oppression in something external to ourselves and be dedicated and passionate and eloquent about that. <laughs> but when it comes to actually opening up our own pursuits and our own stories, it creates much more vulnerability. We tend to bear that more silently, more quietly. We've individualized our burdens as, um, as, you know, as if we're separate human beings to some extent, which tends to create less capacity to work in concert, to engage these issues at all levels, from the personal up to the global. <coughs> so part of the, the, the work that needs to be done for healing and renewal <coughs> is to socialize our burdens. You know, we don't just want to take the benefits in society and distribute them more fairly, but the burdens as well. It's two sides to the same coin. 
So those are some of the big picture things we're going to talk about. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're not the only ones doing this work right now. Actually, if you look around um, a, a number of activist communities, these issues of how to deal with burnout, persecution, frustration, feelings of futility, these are pretty prevalent across a wide range of activist communities. <coughs> so I adapted a few of these bullet points from a workshop that was done in a Occupy Memphis. But this is just one of many. This is kind of the common thread right now, especially as we realize that after all the years we've been working on social justice and environmental issues, in some ways you can make the argument that things have actually gotten worse you know, just objectively speaking, we seem to be sliding further downhill instead of, you know, upholding these kinds of rights and issues that we care so deeply about. How can that be the case? And if that's true, that we can pass the torch from political parties back and forth and nothing seems to change, in some ways, you know, like I said, the tide seems to be turning in the wrong direction, you can see the psychological implications for those of us who are engaged with these issues. It leads to feelings of futility, a sense of burnout, ineffectiveness. But I would submit to you that there is no act of resistance that's ineffective. Every single act that we take to try to make this the world that we would like to live in, rather than the one that's imposed upon us, is a radical act, is a hopeful act, and is an effective act. Every single one. It's just hard to see that sometimes. Because the big picture, the news of the day, constantly bombards us with a sense that what we do doesn't really matter all that much. Things are going to slide inexorably towards some predetermined, inevitable outcome, which is probably not going to be good. You know, we know the story of, you know, civilization, the kind of, you know, Judeo-Christian theological version, the metaphorical Titanic version. You know, it's, um, we're on a collision course with our own hubris, and there's not much to be done about it. That's the standard operating narrative. But for me, in many ways, that's exactly the point where resistance comes in, and where our renewal comes in to resist that sense that it's all been written already. If that was the case, then, you know, then really, why are we even still bothering to, to gather? Why are we talking? I feel like as long as there's still that window of opportunity open, the final chapters aren't written. It may be the case that everything we've done up to this point has been completely ineffective, except in one small way. It's kept the window of opportunity from being slammed shut altogether. That's a lot. It doesn't sound like a lot. If I said to you, wow, you've been so successful as an activist, you have incrementally slowed the rate of destruction. Good job. <laughs> You're like, okay, let's have a party. That's great. But you know what? In some ways, that's everything. Because without all of that, without all the struggles of people before us, on whose shoulders we stand, without all the work that we do in the present, that we've done in the past, that we will do in the future, maybe the point is moved. We're not there, though. We still have that window of opportunity. And that's a real point to motivate and mobilize us as we think about what we project onto the next generations. So, we're going to explore a couple of the issues here. I want to put this in a context that's both personal and interpersonal. So here are some of the things, the common issues that activists often struggle with. The things that I see, and I'm willing to own this in myself, that I see in me when I look in the mirror and think about, am I doing what I need to be doing in this world? Um, and by the way, let me just preface this by saying that I don't present something on radical empathy as if I figured it out or it's some finally evolved concept for me. This is being negotiated in real time. This is the kind of work that I see as being extremely important. When I hit the resonance frequency of it and I can see it happening, I see the power of it, but it's elusive. It takes a lot of time and a lot of forethought and a lot of practice to get it right because we're not well trained in these kinds of skills. But here are some of the pitfalls that I can identify, and I see the mirror very clearly when I put these up here. So this is about me as much as it's potentially about you. First of all, we have reactivism. So much of what we do is conditioned by what's happening outside of us. We're always reacting to the next atrocity, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. We're playing defense, yes. almost all the time. And there's a lot of good reason to do that. Let's face it, I listed some down here. We're responding to crises. We're confronting injustice interrupting oppression. These are really important things to do. And yet, they don't often give us the opportunity to step back and say, well, what about the positive side? You know, where's the capacity to imagine a different future rather than always responding to the one that's being marketed at us or being imposed upon us? So this is a, a real issue for us, is being reactive rather than having the capacity to go beyond that. <coughs> 
Next is lactivism. How often do we hear this in our circles? I feel like I'm, we're not really making a difference. We're losing the issue. Oh, you know, at the end of the day, you just can't fight City Hall. These kinds of fatalistic expressions. I feel like I'm not doing enough. If only I had done more, something would have turned out different. So we have this sense that even if we have victories, we tend to marginalize our own wins, our own you know, positive results by saying, well, but there's a larger issue. There's so many oppressions. They're all interconnected. The global nature of these things is so monumental. How do I get my mind around all that? Sure, we saved one, you know, one patch of green space here, or we protected one group of vulnerable people, or we helped empower one community, but there's such a vast world. There's so many issues. You can spin this over and over again in your mind and kind of put yourself into a corner where nothing seems to be effective, that we're just not doing enough. There's too much on our plates, there's you know, too much to do, too little time, and again, it leads us to these expressions of potential futility. So here's the other side of it, which is that we want to do something, so sometimes we do clicktivism, sometimes known as slacktivism, <laughs> right? This is the one where you get to sit in your comfortable sofa and feel like you're doing good because you click on a banner or you click a like button or you set up a Facebook page or you email around links. I mean, how often do activists, especially those of us you know, t tending toward the left side of the spectrum, we associate our activism with forwarding links to our friends. <laughs> wow, I did a lot today. I got a thing posted on a website and I got this you know, thing connected where people looked at it and I could see the number rose up and there's a hundred Facebook likes and you know, we can, you can see that it becomes a thing, but in some ways it's kind of you know, a mile wide and an inch deep, right? It does reach people, we know that. And we don't have to, to abandon the technologies. It's not a critique of the technologies. You know, we have to make of these things what we will. But sometimes it becomes easy to fool ourselves into thinking that we're being effective because after all, there's a lot of feelings of futility and the challenges that I just mentioned. So of course, it makes sense that we would see that Facebook like meter rising and think, wow, we're making a difference here. Whether or not that leads to action in the world, we don't necessarily connect those dots. We don't even know if it does in a lot of cases. We know that we created something that has a self-referential quality. It maybe discharges some feelings of our own guilt. It makes us feel productive. We can see a numerical outcome to it in many cases. I mobilized 100,000 people to care about Darfur. Okay, great, but what did they do? What happened in Darfur? Did the conditions change? Did it get to the root causes? So again, you know, these are like ways that they might be more palliative than, than realistic. But to some extent, they're a challenge of activism because they, you know, they kind of tempt us into thinking that we've done something useful and maybe it even becomes kind of an obsession where we're putting more and more of our eggs in that basket and losing a little bit of the texture of our human communities that I would submit makes us more effective as activists. I like to think of it this way. If your house was on fire, would you call your Facebook friends or your actual friends who live near you who can come and help you do something? Right? Your Facebook friends are great, but it only goes so far. It does not replace the face-to-face -face work that we need to do in the world. And then finally, this is the last of the negative ones, and I'll move on to the positive ones. Am I deep into your despair yet? That's part of my job as an empathetic activist. Cracktivism, right? And you can, get, can almost get addicted to it, and if you think about the irony here is that you need a constant streamline, you need to be mainlining crisis, mainlining oppression. We need more injustice in the world, damn it, otherwise I'll have nothing to do. So I have more to do, I can't stop now. I'll take care of my needs later. It's just more important that I'm attached to these larger issues. My life may be falling apart, but the work is going really well. You know? Classic signs of addiction, right? These are things that, that people say in a lot of other contexts. You get that buzz and the sense of release and you need new challenges to fill the void. Sometimes it can obscure the reasons why we do things in the first place. We just get kind of addicted to being the outsider, being the righteous crusader, being the maverick, the lone voice of reason in our circles, the one at the Thanksgiving table who takes on the conservative family members and sets them straight. We wear these as badges of honor. We kind of self-martyr in some ways. There's good reasons for all this, again, you know, I'm looking at you, but I'm thinking about myself as I'm saying all this. <laughs> I've worn all these hats, right? And, and you go through cycles where one ebbs and one flows, and you're sort of, you know, moving between these different forms of potential activist burnout. So, 
Here are some solutions, at least moving toward potential solutions. And you can read the slide right there. Activism is the rent I pay for living on this planet. We have to be activists. It's not really a choice. Every single one of us has to be active in creating the world that we live in. It's not a passive act. Reality is not a spectator sport. It's a participant sport. We're part of creating it. We're not just consumers of this reality. We're its co-creators. And that's an awesome burden, but it's also a sense of opportunity. So here are some ways to lessen the impact of some of the, the harsh realities that I was talking about just before. <coughs> Contactivism. Reclaiming the human dimension in our work. Never letting it become so impersonal that we lose that texture of being in proximity. As I said to some folks a couple of months ago, there won't be a pheromone-free revolution in our time. <laughs> we need to be connected to each other. The simple acts, the breaking of bread, the telling of stories, the shaking of hands, the hugging, the building of trust, that's important. We can't skip those pieces. And in fact, not only can we not skip them at the expense of the, the efficacy of our work, but we can't skip them for our own selves. We need that input, we need those reality checks. We need to be present and front and center for the communities that we are connected to. So reclaiming that, and sharing those face-to-face -face moments, building relationships. In some ways, it all comes down to relationships. It's the basis of empathy, it's the basis of action, and it's actually an expression of the nature of the cosmos itself. Nothing is static, everything exists in relationships. Reclaiming that is a way to be part of something larger and also nourish our, our own selves at the same time. Impactivism. Just a little reminder that you are doing good work in the world, you're making a difference, your work matters, and by the way, we can also celebrate our successes every now and then without having every moment of saying, wow, we did a good thing, also be like, yeah, but we've got another thousand things to work on. That's true. But sometimes we can just pause on the good things we've done and celebrate the fact that we're here, we're still having these conversations, we're evolving them over time. I see things like Local to Global as a big part of that. This is basically a decade-long evolving think tank. The players change, the, the names change, the issues evolve, but we're working on something here. And this is just one container of many. Find those moments, whether it's small circles, larger ones, or even global networks, that allow us to celebrate the positive impact we're making without, you know, kind of resting on our laurels. We still have to get up the next day and roll up our sleeves. But in the meantime, we can focus on some of the things we've done right. And then begin to export those models. Wow, yeah, I heard about these people who had a campaign that they launched to save a public place or to work in a community or, you know, set up restorative justice circles. How did they do that? Get in contact, find out what worked. Use the model, adapt it to your own local place. You know, look for successes and multiply those rather than the reaction to the crises that we're often caught up in. And you know, taking it moment by moment, day by day. Not always feeling like the pressure of all of human history is on our shoulders. Things didn't get to be this way overnight and we're not gonna fix them overnight. It's gonna take a long time. In fact, many of the issues that we care deeply about won't be resolved in our lifetimes. These issues will be constantly engaged. In fact, in a healthy society, they should be constantly engaged by the people that are living in that time and place. For us, our task is maybe to bear the part we can bear as we're here, evolve it, try to turn the paradigm in a positive way, contribute as much as we can, leave the next generation with the tools and the capacity and the window of opportunity to continue the work. That's not so bad. Being part of a long, unbroken chain of people who care about things feels pretty good, actually, to me in some way. So never giving up hope, knowing that at the end of the day, you know, we will get this right. We will get this right. Humankind is, uh, you know, an evolving uh, creation. We're kind of um, in our, you know, maturation years. We're teenagers who have found the lighter in our parents' drawer, you know? The question is, are we going to incinerate everything around us, or will we learn to responsibly use it to light the flame of dissent and activism rather than the destructive potential embedded in it? We can't put the tools back in the bottle. We can't, you know the old saying, once the toothpaste is out, you can't put it back in the tube. We have to live with the capacity we've, we've given ourselves to take all of this away. But in that comes the moment of potential maturation as well. Every teenager learns this. I can do a lot of damage. That's the moment where you're like, in your power as a young person, like I can actually do a lot of damage to the world and myself. 
But learning to live with that capacity and use it for positive purposes is very hopeful. The vast majority of us do make that leap. We come upon that knowledge. Collectively, the same is possible as well. <coughs> and then there's thanktivism. Sometimes just looking around and having a little moment of a gratitude check. <coughs> being appreciative of the people that you're in community with. The people you're in struggle with. The community. Thank you for honoring all of us. I mean, that's the idea, right? That we don't always take moments to do that. Just even if they're small. They don't have to be uncomfortably awkward. Let's all bow to each other now and, you know, do some kind of thing. I mean, it doesn't have to be formalized, but just taking a moment to acknowledge the hard work that people do and that, that we really appreciate each other. In fact, we can even say that we love each other. And it's okay to do that sometimes, you know? Maybe part of our task as activists and avoiding to be burned out and renewing ourselves is to become re-enchanted with the world around us, re-enchanted with each other and ourselves in the process. Maybe reflecting on the fact that there's actually more good than bad in the world. The news wants to tell us something different. You're not going to see a headline, you know, cue on a website or in a print newspaper laying out all the good things that happened in the world that day. You're not going to open the paper and say, peace breaks out. Woo it doesn't go like that, right? The reason that the negative tends to dominate our psyche is because, in fact, it's actually an interruption in the normal flow of things. How many days do you go about your business where you hurt somebody? You physically confront somebody, you know? You do something intentionally malicious? Probably not all that many. That's true for the vast majority of people on this planet. The norm is actually that there's more good than bad in the world. Bad holds a lot of sway, <clears throat> and bad has its own 24-hour news channels. But we don't need that, because we know that there's actually more people doing good and more capacity for good. It just doesn't get talked about as much. And then, you know, finally, maybe reflecting on the fact that having the challenges before us are a blessing in some ways. I would be more worried about us individually and collectively if we didn't appreciate the fact that we have challenges in our midst. If I had to come here and tell you, people, wake up, the world is in crisis, get yourselves going, if that was the beginning of this conversation, we'd be so far away from being able to do anything about it, you know? In some ways, the fact that we have the challenges, that the crises are palpable, you don't have to stretch that far to find one. It's all around us. It's in the food we're eating, it's in the room we're sitting in, it's the money that flows through our coffers and our wallets every day. That crisis is embedded in the day-to-day -day business of our lives. And that can be a blessing. Because we're halfway there to the conversation. If we, couldn't, if we couldn't isolate the nature of the problem, we'd be one big step removed. We know the problem. Now we're having the, the conversation about what to do about it. So we're halfway there, actually. It's not so bad. And then finally, the ultimate kind of wrapper here is moving from reactivism to proactivism. Can we sometimes suspend our disbelief and seek to create the alternative world that we would like to live in, rather than always thinking about it in terms of how to ameliorate the issues before us, can we actually create and model what the alternative would look like? Now, if we can do that, right, if we can invent new ways of being in the world, new processes, we can build that future, if we can even have glimpses of that, moments where we do that, that gives us a pretty good vision to set our minds on. Then we could come back and look at the world as it's presently wired, and we could see the, the reality before us, but then we have this glimpse, this picture. Maybe it's just a hesitant thing, we've experienced it for a short time, but we have a little bit of that vision that we're aiming for, then it becomes an equation. A equals where we are now, C equals where we'd like to go, and B is the connective tissue. It's the actions we're gonna take to move from A to C. It's not that complicated, actually, you know, but part of it, is complicated. It's the part where we have to be present enough to suspend our disbelief and say, you know, sometimes the game seems rigged, but there's still a lot of room here. If we can imagine a better world, then we can create it. It's, you know, it's as simple as that. If we couldn't imagine it, again, we'd be in a worse place. You know, we couldn't even get to that place where we can see it in our mind's eye. You know, that's not so great, because then it's like, well, what are we even aiming toward? But if we can do it, and we can have glimpses, backyard gardens, and community meeting spaces, and moments where we get to share our stories with each other, building you know, bonds of solidarity. That's powerful. And being proactive can be a really important way to ease some of the impact of feeling like we're constantly being ineffective, that we're always responding to crisis. This gives us a chance 
to be proactive in putting our vision out there. And lo and behold, when we do that, it often becomes infectious. Others begin to pick up on it. They see the positive example. They want to compare notes. They ask for us to come and do a, you know, a little speaking tour. We share what worked. I mean, it can, you know, positive can turn into positive. We can get that feedback loop working in a good way rather than in a negative way. So, let me change the, the nature of how I get at this a little bit. And once I get through these slides, you know, I'm kind of learning this as, as we do it. It's fun to do it in real time, and I appreciate you letting me have some space to do that. These are things that I often think about, but I don't often speak about. It's not the standard, you know, talk that I would give on radical empathy. I didn't have that. I was actually cobbling together things I've been thinking about for the last few years. But it turns out that there are some real cutting edge theories of human biology and human science that are suggesting our capacities to do exactly the kinds of positive turning that I'm describing here. One is a notion called mirror neurons. How many folks have heard of mirror neurons before? One. And that's because I told you about it. No. <laughs> Macho told us both about it. So a couple of folks, right? So mirror neurons. This is like, you know, the cutting edge of, of neuroscience here. Here's the, here's the idea. It's, it's sometimes expressed anecdotally. Peace Pilgrim has a great quote. She said, the world is rather like a mirror. If you smile at it, it smiles at you. And it sounds pretty innocent. It isn't that sweet. You know, it's very nice. Peace Pilgrim, you know. But we have other colloquial ways of saying it. Laughter is contagious, right? You've heard this one before. Sometimes somebody in a room will sneeze and suddenly three other people will sneeze. There's ways that we're actually wired to emulate responses, to have our responses emulate behaviors that are displayed to us. So the simple act of observing another's behavior conditions an autonomic response in us to emulate that behavior. This isn't just you know, anecdotal. I'm not gonna pretend to be a neuroscientist. I can't give you the specific biological underpinnings, but you know, look it up and do some research on your own. This is meant to just kind of spark your imagination. I'm invoking these scientific slides as um, talking points and points to, to potentially inspire a conversation. But I get the idea of what they're saying here, that there's a great empathetic potential. When we observe, or we maybe contribute to creating positive responses on the behalf of others, it comes back to us and triggers similar feelings in ourselves. Conversely, if there are negative things going on and we're contributing to negative outcomes, that comes back on us too. It's kind of the, the neuroscience of karma in a way. You know, the do unto others. That if we are putting it out there in a positive way, it is likely to come right back to us on an autonomic level. We may not even be aware of it. It doesn't mean it maps one-to-one, -one, that everything that happens automatically occurs back in us. It's not a precise mirror, but it stimulates empathetic responses at the neurological level. So it gives us a deeper understanding of the plight of the other. We are actually in the other's shoes. It's not just an expression. There's a part of us that's in everyone else around us. If something good is happening and we're helping somebody else, you know, to be what they can be in the world, that actually stimulates a positive response back in us. So the quote from Ramachandran is that the neural basis of the rest, it's the neural basis of the reciprocity of self-awareness and other awareness. We are always aware of the other. And the attitudes and, and uh, abilities and potentials of the other are actually part of ourselves. Whether we process it consciously or not, it's happening on a neurological level. So that's neuroscience's contribution to empathy. Here's genetic research's contribution, something called epigenetics. Has anybody heard of this one? A couple of hands in the room. So again, another one to look up and do some homework on. There will be a quiz at the end of this talk. So epigenetics. Epi meaning external, like epidermis, the thing you're wearing on the outside. Epigenetics says that um, there are non-genetic factors that can cause an organism's genes to behave differently. External stimuli affect the development of our genetics. Now that seems to be like, is that science really? Because you know we, we learn that it's more like a code gets read out and then certain potentials are created and then each of us you know, live, kind of fills that container and lives to those potentials. But it's actually the external stimuli that help determine which of the potentials we will reach. Our genetic code is like a floor, not a ceiling. It gives us a basis from the individual to spring forth, but it's not a determination of who we will be. The cultural influences, the external influences, both good and bad, 
The way this is usually studied is around people who have suffered a trauma. And then when the researchers go back to look at the succeeding generations, maybe it's a great famine or a big war or some you know, isolated event where people have experienced a collective trauma, when they go back and look at succeeding generations, they find similar kinds of genetic responses, genetic outcomes that are too um, prevalent to be explained by random chance. In other words, the trauma is passed from the generation that experienced it to their children and then their children's children. And even further down the line, historical wounds have an intergenerational capacity to them. It's kind of startling, actually. Some theories speculate that, um, that it's partly held by the environment itself, both literally and figuratively, that the places where people live bear some of the memory, both in terms of toxicity after a war, but also maybe something more transcendent than that. But at the genetic level, the idea is that when a child is in the womb, it's exposed to the trauma that's then filtered by the parent, right? It's filtered. It's not like a direct perception, but it expresses itself in the genetic outcomes of the child. It's not just in utero, too. Some of these studies suggest that it continues even in our early childhood years as we're in that very impressionable formative time in our lives. The external stimuli affect the genetic and physical outcomes of people. That's a pretty remarkable insight. And again, I'm not a geneticist. I can't tell you I understand the science of it. I'm just a layperson interpreting it. But I see here the capacity for thinking much more transgenerationally, much more intergenerationally. And again, the crisis is an opportunity because if a trauma can be passed from generation to generation, so too can positive outcomes. If we turn this needle just a little bit toward the positive, that will start having a, a ripple effect and paying more dividends. Good thoughts get emulated, good thoughts and actions get emulated by others around us. That creates a deeper sense of well-being at the personal and community, maybe even global level. The children that are coming after those generations experiencing that, they get that by osmosis. It becomes part of their DNA. They wake up and they expect to look at the world as a glass half full rather than half empty. You can see the, the effect. We're not so far off. We have the mechanisms in place. We just need to change the input a little bit move from this kind of repetitive trauma, repetitive tragedy mode that we're in, and turn it into you know, more of the positive outcome. Change the input and the spiral, same, same conditions that create a kind of you know, feedback loop of, of despair and futility can easily be turned on their head toward the opposite purpose. And then finally, my last heavy science slide. So we had neuroscience, we have genetics, and now we have consciousness. Cutting edge theories of consciousness. Has anyone ever heard of the quantum Zeno effect? I knew that one would get no hands. <laughs> the, only, the only reason I ever heard about it is because my youngest son's name is Zeno. So when we looked up his name, after we named him, this came up. I'm like, that's pretty crazy. Who is that one? <laughs> it's the physics of consciousness. The connection between thought and reality. Now many of us who have a contemplative practice in our lives already know this. In fact, I think colloquially we all get this. How many times have you had this happen where you, know, you hear something for the first time, or you're thinking about something, and then it comes up like three times in a row? Like we do tend to create the reality around us. The power of our thoughts cannot be understated, cannot be overstated. Well, either way, actually. You know, we do tend to project a lot of energy out. We just don't always feel like that's a, a you know, valid way of looking at things. There's so much noise, there's so many thoughts circulating. Life's needs are much more immediate. We're often brought down to the basic, you know, more coping in the physical parts of our lives. We forget this piece of the puzzle, that we actually have the capacity to influence reality by thinking about it. The way this gets expressed through the quantum Zeno effect is that things come into being when people fix their gaze upon it. So, you know, we don't find the electron until we use our measuring device to ask reality to collapse to a point that can be measurable as an electron. We find it when we look for it to some extent. If we don't engage something around us, it tends to lose its integrity. It's, there's actually theories that suggest that it's our observation of the universe that makes it real in the first place. It's our gaze upon it, the frequent gaze, the frequent measurement that prevents things from winking out or decaying altogether. I know it sounds a little mind-boggling, but the reality is, you know, both the indigenous cosmology and quantum mechanics suggest that 
Everything is kind of an assemblage of probability patterns. Little small pieces all swirling around and vibrations, they crystallize in coherent moments like myself and all of you and the objects around us, but that's more the tip of the iceberg. That's illusory to some extent. A deeper reality is that these things are actually not so different than the thoughts that emanate from our heads. In fact, the thought may be the reality in and of itself. So I don't want to go too far down this road because it starts to get a little, um, well, a little loose in the way of describing it, and I'm no expert in it, although I did study physics at one point, but they didn't teach us this. I'll tell you that. If they did, I'd probably still be studying physics right now, because I like this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, we start to learn that we are both the dreamer and the dream, the thinker and the one experiencing the reality around us. It's just another expression of deep empathy, that we are so coupled with our environment, ourselves, the bodies we're wearing, each other, and the larger environment. We're so coupled with it that we are in an empathetic relationship, a constant exchange with these things around us. It gives us a lot of power. So here's just a couple of other ways of synthesizing as we move towards some closure here in terms of what I wanted to share with you. And then we'll open it up for some dialogue and exchange so you can help me figure out what these things mean. Um, I see it you know, as three kind of big levels in our lives. These are all falsities to some extent, self, society, and nature. But yet they're kind of iconic. You know, there are three points where the energies really do converge when we think about the world around us. They're not the only three points. It's more of a spectrum than isolated places. But nonetheless, they do mean something, and they're worth looking at from that perspective. First of all, we have the self. So I suggested at the beginning empathy for the radical. Let's not lose sight of the self. Sometimes there's a, a way of thinking about the world that suggests we're supposed to transcend the self, or that the self is unimportant. I don't think that that's the case, actually. I think we do matter. There's a reason why the universe wanted to see itself through your eyes, why your life path is unique to you. No one else connects the dots of space and time the way you do. We matter as individuals. That's an important part of the whole. And the care of the self should be part of the way we think about the whole. The same mechanisms we can use to make our own lives work better, healthier food, better relationships, you know, be consuming more consciously, consuming less, being less implicated in structures of oppression, those are all good strategies for promoting social change as well. So the care of the self is really a big part of it. When sometimes we hear about spiritual paths that include this notion of, you know, kind of transcending or letting go of the self, that's only possible when the self is healthy and doing well. Then you can let it go because it's working well and you can move on to other planes, but you need that self to be actualized. So let's not skip that step. And then care of others. This was a quote from our friend Nipun Mehta, who recently wrote, when we engage at the cusp of our own evolution, we can't help but broaden from self-orientation to other orientation. We honor our profound interconnection. And as we align with a natural unfolding that is greater than us, we continue to tra transform ourselves. So care of the other is both an altruistic and a self-interested phenomenon at the same time. I have a deep investment in how well you all are doing because I care about you all, but also because living in a society where people do that as a matter of course feeds back into making all of us prosper as well. I can't be everything I'm supposed to be unless you all are what you're supposed to be. Martin Luther King it was not a US Army marketing phrase, be all you can be. King said it first that none of us as individuals can get there to that promised land unless we all get there together, just by definition. Right? Equality is something that has to be equally distributed. I can't be equal and free if you're not. We need to have those things happen at the same time. And then finally, care of the environment, which we were never separate from. It was a moment of great historical amnesia to wake up one day and think that we were somehow not part of the great web of life and all of the constraints and opportunities that that puts before us. We are always embedded in the processes of nature. On a, on a substance level, the resources we need to survive, we're all consumers, we all are in a symbiotic relationship, maybe a parasitic one sometimes it feels like, but what kind of parasite kills the host organism after all, right? And even at that crass level you would think, well we should probably think about sustaining the habitat, that seems like a good idea, after all it does give us everything we need to survive, you know. Again, you don't have to stretch that far. You can make an appeal to self-interest and get people to environmentalism. You don't have to cast it in these kind of you know, meta-theoretical terms or these big picture or you know, getting to people's conscience. 
even our own self-interest should compel us to think about the other and the larger environment. It's really not that complicated. This stuff has been known forever. It's just the last you know, few hundred, maybe a couple thousand years, we've forgotten some of it, or we pretended that we forgot it. You know, we may believe because it served certain purposes. But these processes are embedded in the way of things, the neurology of things, right? The genetics of our lives, the consciousness that pervades. There are certain ways that the world is wired. We're part of it. We're lucky to be part of it. It's actually kind of, you know, um, surprisingly interesting. It gives us a lot of possibility to increase our empathy rather than our separateness and our despair. Here's just another kind of big picture, pulling back slowly kind of point. Just, you know, focusing a little more in our day-to-day -day lives on solidarity. We talk about it a lot, but we don't always manifest it. We get caught in turf wars and, you know, there's a finite resources and we're competing over them. We have personality conflicts. We've all been there. We're probably there right now, you know? It's part of the way things go. But that's also the, the magic, too, is that unity isn't something that we all just get along and say, wow, we agree on everything. Life is good. That would be super boring. And I would rebel against that kind of utopia where everybody, all the challenges were fixed and everything was great. It's about unity in diversity. It's those two things existing at the same time. We need the conflicts. We need the challenges. Seeing that as, as a, an opportunity for solidarity is part of our task. Not to eradicate conflict and difference, to celebrate it, promote it, and then use it as a driver for greater forms of solidarity. So that solidarity isn't just a superficial thing. It's actually key. It's the, it's the part of diversity that shows itself when we appreciate how different we are and how we're looking at things from different perspectives. Our work is complementary as much as it's in opposition with each other. And forming those kinds of bonds um, becomes a really important way of thinking about the world. Our liberation is bound up with that of every other being on the planet, the big picture of solidarity. Doesn't mean it's all the same. Equality is not sameness. It means everything's accorded its equal place in the great web of life and the, the, the reality that we're creating. But So diversity is still in there, but yet they're all interconnected in a non-superficial way. And then the ethic of care, which has gone through many different incarnations. Uh, Mel Noddings and Carol Gilligan and many others have reflected on this. The idea is that all individuals are interdependent. Here's Martin Luther King quote. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. So we are connected that way. It's a basic proposition. It's been understood by pretty much every culture that's existed on the planet, save the one we're living in now. We get it, so it's part of our task to bring that, that message in and of itself, interbeing, interconnectedness in a non-superficial way. That one concept by itself can change the whole nature of the, of the world that we're living in. And the other part of the ethic of care is that those who are in particular vulnerable to the choices we make deserve extra consideration. So we do know that we're not all equal, freely competing subjects, and there's some objective standard, and the cream rises, and it's the opposite of cream, I don't even know, but it falls behind, right? We have this mythology, the American dream idea. As long as there's fair and neutral standards and everyone competes equally, the good shall win, and the not so good shall be, you know, on the other side of the equation. But that's not true. We know that we're not starting from the same places. We're not gifted with the same tools and privileges. We're not afforded the same opportunities in terms of education and healthcare, et cetera. We know that many of us enjoy great privilege. In fact, everyone in this room, vis-a-vis -vis most of the people on the planet, enjoy great privilege. So that means that when we're making choices and others who are potentially more vulnerable are exposed to the consequences of those choices, they deserve extra consideration. 